Hi, watch everyone. Welcome. Um, my English name is Jules, or part of my English name is Jules Kustachin. Uh, my Inu walk name is Woman Who Holds Fire. I'm Inu, otherwise known as Cree, from the Meshkegawak Territory in Northern Ontario, Treaty Number Nine. And I'm a PhD student here. I'm a PhD. I just said the PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Freudian slip, who knows? <laughs> I am a PhD student here at the Institute of, uh, for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here today on the traditional, ancestral, unceded, and occupied territory of the Mus uh, Musqueam peoples here on Coast Salish land. So before I go on to introduce our speaker, I would like to make a plug for the lecture series next term, right Jen? <laughs> uh, so if you haven't already, stay tuned for other events that we are putting on next term. Each one will be on a Wednesday from 12 to 1, I believe mid-January, with lunch provided with an RSVP. We have a Facebook uh, events page, Social Justice Institute UBC Events as well as Twitter, and I'm not a Twitter person, so I had to clarify this one <laughs> as well, the little number sign, no, okay. Um, <laughs> at GRC, right? Uh, in J GRSJ Institute, so please use the hashtag, and there's a number sign? <laughs> 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 My kids always laugh at me because I just suck at Twitter. <laughs> um, GRSJ or Hashtag GRSJ events. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ray Sue, yes, talks uh, begin with the question. Uh, talk begins with the question: How can we do social justice work in the prison industrial complex as scholarly and liter literary writers, drawing on his experience teaching experiences teaching writing for over two years in the North American prison industrial complex, as well as the university industrial complex. He asks, where do they converge and where do they diverge? What do they reveal about the limits and possibilities of the public humanities? Dr. Ray Su's research and writing areas include Asian North American studies, creative writing, and entrepreneurship. He is the author of two books of poetry, Anthropy, winner of the Gerald Lambert's Award, shortlisted for the Trillium Book Award for Poetry, and Cold Sleep, Permanent Afternoon, winner of the Alcuin Award, <laughs> and uh, he taught in a U.S. prison for over two years before becoming co-founder of Art Song Lab and Morpheus VR. His current work explores unruly realities at the intersection of social life and virtu virtual reality uh, technologies. Please help me welcome Dr. Ray Sue. Thanks, Jules. Hey, y'all. Um, so first off, thanks so much for making it out today. Um, I know that in the fields, uh, we call this a hairy time of year. Um, so I appreciate it very much. Um, OK, so one of the things that I want to start off on is that this talk has to deal with um, a what paradox at its core, which is the fact that I am up here um, speaking to you today. Now, one of the ways in which I've decided to address that core um, is by um, bringing the work of one of the writers with whom I worked. So this is a piece by Tuile, um, who is one of the incarcerated writers who was part of the creative writing workshop um, that I facilitated at Oak Hill Correctional Institution. Um, and so let me just play this piece right now. <coughs> But there is also a serious side to the writer, to the poet. And I want to share with you a, quote, a quotation from the writer, uh, Ralph Ellison. And I quote, perhaps the most insidious and least understood form of segregation is that of the word. And by this, I mean the word and all its complex formulations, from the proverb to the novel. The word with all its subtle power to suggest and foreshadow overt action while magically disguising the moral consequences of that action and providing it with symbolic and psychological justification. For if the word has the potency to revive and make us free, it has also the power to blind, imprison, and destroy. And that leads into a poem that I entitled, 
what makes you so dangerous? The answer. I've given some thought, consideration to your question, and it's the knowledge of my past, present, and future that made me <coughs> so dangerous. It's the stifling of my recognized potential for positive growth and progress, correct, <coughs> and planting the seeds of potential destruction that makes me so dangerous. It's not being able to find the mechanisms inside of me that prevent care and compassion from turning to hatred, and what is deemed love from turning to distrust and anger that makes me so dangerous. Being one of the living dead, rejected socially, politically, economically, ethnically, racially, familially, and all the other leads is what makes me so dangerous. Not being seen nor heard, forsaken, is what makes me so dangerous. As I'm sure you've heard, that ignorance is bliss. However, knowing and a grasp of knowledge, wisdom, and potential make me so dangerous. Just being a black man, visually indistinguishable from other black men, is what makes me so dangerous. Being able to see beyond today the kiss of death, not fearing its arms outstretched, embracing, makes me so dangerous. The question is not whether I am dangerous, but who can and or will venture beyond the danger and delve into the abyss that contains my joy? Would you? It did not escape me, the impetus, latent or otherwise, that you made such an inquiry of me. Yet, be not mistaken by my reply to the degree that you might believe that I have a monopoly on being dangerous. Not until at least you look inside and beyond to see what makes you so dangerous, too. So that was a piece by Tuile. Um, the reason why this was even recorded in the first place was because um, when I was teaching creative writing and also essay writing in Oak Hill Correctional Institution, one of my colleagues, um, an undergraduate who ran a radio show um, that was just off campus um, called Literally Literal, um, and it was very literary, um, he said, why don't you bring recording equipment into the prison so you can record um, an episode of the radio show from the prison. Um, and the first thought that occurred to me was, well, good luck ever getting that approved by the pr prison administrators, you know. Um, but, you know, um, we tried. And um, six months later, he, um, I heard back from the person who's the equivalent of the principal, you know, so the head of education at Oak Hill Correctional Institution. Um, and he said, okay, so it's been approved. You know, so then we go in and we record an episode of the radio show um, from inside the prison. Um, now, that's, that's um, what you need to know about the context or some of what you need to know about the context of this. Um, but first off, I want to give you a sense of the larger picture. So we're going to take a step back for a moment. What are we going to do it with? We're going to do it with numbers. Okay, so um, a report was released by the Pew Center on the States um, that um, pointed out one in 100 adults in the US are incarcerated. Um, just the year afterwards, if you open up the definition to people who are um, on parole and on probation, that goes up to one in 31 adults in the US. So, okay, state spending on um, corrections, 52 billion. And spending on corrections quadrupled in 20 years, making it the fastest growing budget allocation behind Medicaid. So that's to give you a sense of the scale. OK, so um, what does it mean to be doing um, work that, um, where the university and the prison are proximate? We start thinking about things like this. One year at Princeton University costs 37000 One year at a New Jersey state prison, 44000 Okay, so let me give you a sense of where it all started. I was a PhD student in the English department at University of Wisconsin-Madison. The Center for the Humanities decided to open up 
um, research grants. Um, and it's very interesting, um, the category that they opened it up under, you know, research grants. Um, and we can say more about this too. Um, these were grants that were for graduate students to do um, work in the public humanities. So one of the things that we had to do was we had to find a community organization with which we could partner and then um, do a project in which um, we were able to do something that um, required us being there as graduate students. Um, and this for someone who has spent um, all his time um, studying English literature, um, you know, across literary um, historical periods, because that's the way that English literary studies is divided up, um, almost, well, um, it's a major organizing principle of English literature, um, meant that I had to start thinking about, okay, so how does my training um, as an undergraduate student, as a graduate student, um, start to make sense within a context of working with a community organization? So fortunately, um, I happen to be writing in, or working in the writing center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And one of my colleagues who um, taught at a branch location of the writing center, um, which was at a public library, um, there was a writer um, who approached her and said, hey, I'd love some help um, editing with editing this anthology that I'm doing. Um, and she said, okay, I'll try. The anthology was called The First 29 Days because in Wisconsin, um, if you've just come out of prison, you have 30 days um, of public housing before um, you lose your public housing. So basically, um, by the time you lose your public housing, then um, it's that much harder um, you know, to um, get your life in order, order so to speak. Um, and then um, you know, recidivism you know, starts to make sense after that. So, um, so the anthology was um, creative nonfiction by writers who um, had just come out of prison um, and were writing about their first 29 days, basically. Now, uh, my colleague who um, didn't have experience editing an anthology like this um, sent an email out to all of us and said, hey, does anyone with any editing experience um, want to help out? And I said, well, I have some literary experience, because I was also a creative writer alongside my literary studies. We can say more about this division between um, creative writing and English literary studies if we want. Um, that's an entire other ball of wax. <laughs> so um, so I, help out, I help out this anthology editor. His name is Johnny Ellis. Um, and he turns out to be really cool. You know, he um, says, you know what? Let me introduce you to this group um, with which I've been working called uh, voices Beyond Bars. Um, so this group um, is, has as its task to fight recidivism because um, it's mostly composed of formerly incarcerated um, members um, as well as um, interested community members. And um, so then I go to a meeting and we're all sitting around a table and um, I had the misfortune, I suppose, of being the second person to um, introduce themselves. So I didn't quite know what the codes were of um, you know, introducing myself. And I said, hey, I'm Ray. I uh, come from the university. I didn't know what else to say. Um, there was a bit of silence. And then Johnny nudges me and he says, who introduced you? Um, and I said, Johnny introduced me? And, um, uh, and then we continued around the table. Um, there, were, there was another person who said, um, you know, I'm so-and-so. Um, I just got out of prison and I'm so glad to be here. Um, and I started to get a sense of who was around the table. Now, um, at first I thought that I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, well, I did stick out like a sore thumb. Um, but the thing is, is that people started asking me questions about, okay, so what do you do research on? You know, like, um, um, and asking me the, the kinds of things that, that people might ask at parties, you know, like when you're at a cocktail party and people are saying, what do you do? Um, and they, and uh, people were taking an interest. I thought, you know, um, these folks are really cool too. I'm either going to work with them, you know, that would be really amazing, or I'm going to take steps to work inside the prison itself, you know, the, within a prison itself. Um, I opted for the latter, um, which took another six months to find um, a prison that was open to the idea of collaborating on something. And that prison, actually, 
is 17 minutes drive from the university. That's the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Here's Oak Hill Correctional Institution. Um, and it's 17 minutes down the highway. Um, very close, very accessible. Um, if we did want to do something like that again here, you know, um, it would require a much longer drive, not to mention that it would take finding a, um, a particular prison that would be open to the idea of collaboration in the first place. So um, in that sense, it was very situational to um, the layout of where the prison and the university were um, within this particular place. So I go in and um, I'm talking to the teachers um, as well as the person who is the head of education at uh, Oak Hill. And um, they say, okay, so, so what is it that you want to do again? And I say, well, um, I want to teach creative writing. And um, Jack, who is the head of education, he says, well, that's all fine and good, but one of the things that we need help with actually is um, graduating people with um, their HSEDs, which in Wisconsin is, the, um, is like a GED, um, except it's, um, it's given a different name and, and uh, um, there are extra things that are attached to it as well. Um, so they wanted to boost their numbers for graduating the HSEDs. He says, the two hardest things for us to teach here, um, because we don't have the staff capacity to be able to teach it, um, is math and English. You know, we can teach carpentry, we can teach botany, um, but it's, it's that much harder to teach English and math. So he says, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to send to you um, people who are attempting to pass their, um, their GED exams, their essay writing exams, and that's what you can help with. You can help tutor them, you know. Um, basically, what I could have been doing, you know, in a writing center. Um, working with people in order to achieve a writing goal. So, um, so what I did was I went in every week um, and I would not only teach um, essay writing, but I also started a creative writing group. Now, the odd thing about that is that the creative writing group was scheduled at the exact same time as Jim, you know? So, so the people um, who went to the writing group had to choose between going to gym and then, or going to a creative writing group. Um, and you can imagine the kind of community stigma um, that there is around you know, um, being a writer in that context. Um, but those were the kinds of things that um, we were working with. Let me give you a sense of what the geographical layout, or the layout of it is. Okay, let's see if the, uh, it's working here. Okay, so <coughs> when you arrive, um, this is the parking lot of Oak Hill. Um, this is Google Earth, by the way, this is live. So um, if the Wi-Fi cuts out for any reason, then we might just move on. Um, but you arrive in the parking lot, um, you, you start moving up to here, which is the entrance. And here's a fence, a gate right here. You need to buzz in and um, um, whoops. And then once you identify um, who you are, why you're there, um, they let you in through here. And then here is the entryway, the gate, um, the main door where they check your paperwork. There was one particular day in which, um, you know, it was already more than a year into it um, when they forgot our paperwork at the front desk. And, you know, um, my co-teacher and I, because we, by um, regulation, we always had to have one other teacher in the room at the same time, um, said, you know, we've been coming here for a year, you know, every single week, but they didn't have the paperwork, so they didn't let us in. And we said, um, can you let the writers know um, that we'll be, you know, that we tried to make it out, but, you know, we can't get in this week. And then the people behind the desk said, sure. So then next week we arrive, um, and we meet with the writers, and the writer said, hey, uh, we, th we didn't know if you were coming back. We last week, we actually um, sat around for about an hour um, waiting for you. And when you didn't arrive, we didn't know whether you had chosen simply not to come back. Um, and one of them explained that 
um, this is something that happens all the time. You know, it's kind of like uh, uh, people will come to visit them when they're first incarcerated and um, will visit, 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 and then will stop visiting and they will never know why. So that's part of the sense of um, what it meant, you know, um, when the possibility that, that we weren't coming back. Oh, and it should be mentioned that when I first arrived there, um, one of the first questions that I got was, how long are you going to be here? And I said, well, I'm going to be here for the year. At the time, I, I thought I was going to be there for a year. Um, I didn't know that I was going to be there for longer. And you could, or at least I got the sense that it was as if people suddenly relaxed. You know, the fact that um, I wasn't going to be there, you know, once or for a week or something like that. I wasn't parachuting in as an agent of the university to collect my data and go, you know. Um, okay, so then you um, exit out here after the security check, and then um, there's a fenced in area right here. Um, this is a, in 1999, they actually installed a 6,000 uh, linear foot um, electrified fence. You know, so this is, um, it's called a Gallagher stun fence. Gallagher is the name of the company. Um, and so um, it might be a bit hard to see right there, but this is the entire perimeter of the fence. And then, then you get picked up by a little van that is driven by um, one of the incarcerated people. I should mention that when I say incarcerated people or incarcerated writers, this was a deliberate choice on my part um, because the thing that it says on their name tags is offender, Jeez. you know, um, and it says it uh, right below their name. And uh, I could also say, let's say inmate, um, which is what um, is often said in <coughs> text. Um, but I chose to say incarcerated writer in order to emphasize the category of writer and their status as incarcerated. So um, you get picked up by a van, um, which is being driven by one of the incarcerated people. Um, they're paid for it. Um, that's one of the jobs that you have. Right about here is solitary uh, confinement. And as you head down here, it, you're being driven here. These are um, the residences, I guess you could say. That's what they called them. Um, and then all the way down here is the, is the building where um, our, group, our group met. So the van would stop right here, and then we'd get out and walk, and then walk along here. I'd be saying hi to folks, and then we enter through this door. Um, there's a guard room right here with a window, and then the writing, the classroom is right here. So it's within view of the guard room at all times. That's the theory. So, OK. So um, that's how it started. Um, and that's what the layout of the prison <coughs> looks like. Um, you may notice that there's a lot of green on that. Um, in fact, it might look from that aerial view as if it were a campus. And the fact is, is that um, it was once a school for girls. Um, 1931, the prison is built. Um, it, it's dormant, I suppose, for 10 years. 1941, um, it becomes the it becomes a school for girls. Then in about 1977, the school for girls closes. And that's when it gets converted into a prison. Um, so yeah, that's when it became Oak Hill Correctional Institution. So I mentioned that it began, actually, as a um, what, what I was doing in terms of the Prison Writers Project um, was two things. One, it was an essay writing um, tutoring program. Two. It was a creative writing um, workshop as well. And I'm going to be saying more about um, that particular division. When I was um, going to graduate, I knew that this program was going to dissolve because there was no infrastructure for it. Um, it required me to move back and forth 
um, between the university and the prison. It required my co-teacher to be there as well. And we had to graduate. You know, we were students. So one of the best ways that we could um, give it some sort of infrastructure that would last beyond us was if we built it into the curriculum at the university. So the essay writing component ended up being an undergraduate community service learning course in which um, my undergraduate students who were doing composition class, you know, they were learning about essay writing, were learning about essay writing around um, prison issues. And um, then they would go into the prison and they would do the essay writing tutoring work that I had been doing the previous year. So that was the particular course. Um, one of the things about this, though, is there was no one who wanted to take this over you know, when, when um, I graduated. And I remember sitting in the last day of class, um, and the students are around, like we're on campus, and I say, oh, one of the students asks, so what's going to happen to this class? It can't just um, end with us. And I said, I don't know. Um, no one stepped up to take it over. And um, one of the students said, wait, I think I heard about this class in which um, it can be student-led. You know, there's a particular way um, in which like a student-led class, the facilitators get more credit and um, the people who are taking the class um, get standard credit. Um, and then another student says, yeah, actually, one of my friends was involved in this kind of thing. Um, and then they, they started discussing amongst themselves um, how to turn it into a student-run class. And, um, you know, I, I said, well, that's great. You know, it's like, I guess I've been rendered obsolete. Um, and I think to myself that, in fact, that is something that I might aspire to, you know, um, making myself obsolete insofar as that's possible. Um, now, one of the things that I mention about um, being up here at the front is because I wonder to myself, what are all the structures that keep Tuile, let's say, from being up here? Tuile is the person who um, wrote and performed that first poem that I mentioned. Um, what, is it, what does it take for me to be at the front of the room? What does it take for me to even attach my name to my labor? Because that radio show that I mentioned, on the very first day, oh wait, on the day that it was going to air, um, I got a call from the prison administrators and um, they said, don't air this show because if you do, we're going to pull the plug on your program. Jeez. And um, you know, I, I said, why? You know? um, and they said, OK, so their names are mentioned. Their names are mentioned in the radio show. Oh, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's cool. Sorry. No, it's OK. I got to. Um, OK, so, so their names are mentioned in the show. And um, um, I remember going in and um, saying to the writers, OK, do you, want, do you want your names to be mentioned in the show? Do you want pseudonyms? Do you want initials or something like that? And said, we want our full names. And so we recorded the show with their names in it. And um, I, guess, I guess the prison administrators hadn't listened you know, to the copies of the show until very close to the airing date. And uh, when they found out that the names were mentioned, um, they said, OK, this can't go through because um, if one of the victims of one of the writers hears their name on the air, this could set back, for example, treatment you know, or, um, uh, or recovery. And um, you know, so, then, so then we said, OK. Um, what can we do in order to fix this? Um, and they said, OK, remove the names from the show. So then we, we went into the writers as if, um, as if this mattered, you know, as, in, as if we could do anything about it. And we asked the writers, OK, so how do you, how do you feel about this? Um, you know, removing your names. And uh, one of the writers said, well, this is basically the administration um, screwing us all over again. You know, it's like it's clear that they have absolute power. They can do whatever they want. And another writer said, 
you know what? I think that that makes sense because I wouldn't want uh, my victim to be um, set back in their recovery process. So we can see that within the group itself, um, there was, mm, it, wasn't, it wasn't consensus around what, what we could do or, or what people preferred. Now, um, we ended up having just the initials of the writers um, on the radio show. Um, but it became painfully apparent to my co-teacher and I um, whose names were on the show. You know, her name was on the show. My name was on the show. Oak Hill Correctional Institution's name gets to be on the show. Um, the prison administrators, you know, it's like the people who basically um, get to attach their name and collect the, what, rewards, the cultural awards, the whatever good feelings, the pats on the back that um, came with having our names attached to it. So we can see here how our, um, how the incarcerated writers' creative labor um, was something that we could capitalize on. You know, we got to benefit from it. The university got to benefit from it. Um, but the writers themselves couldn't or um, under these conditions could to a lesser degree. You know, um, you know, their names were going to be removed in the first place. Um, now we're going to replace it with initials. So then what we chose to do, and this is, a, this is merely a gesture, um, I think, or at least it's a, it's a very little gesture. Um, but we ended up identifying the prison administrators by their initials as well on the radio show. <laughs> um, it's a small thing, but. OK, so one of the things that I want to um, bring us to is what exactly we mean by radical equality. OK, since then, since that initial moment when um, we had these two branches that morphed into something that was more institutional, more um, infrastructurally sustainable, um, this is where it is now. Creative writing programming. Oh, by the way, this is from the annual report for the prison. Um, creative writing programming. UW-Madison UW graduate students provide instruction to inmates wishing to enhance their creative writing thinking and writing abilities. Classes are eight weeks in length and cover topics within the following areas, poetry, memoir, and fiction writing, and African American studies. Wow. So um, the thing is, is that the essay writing component of it has um, fallen away. You know, um, Since then, um, it's, I, I don't know what the entire history of that falling away is, um, but that hasn't stuck around. Um, but here, we see that creative writing has stuck around. Um, and I want to, let me tell you a bit about how creative writing instruction works. And this is standard across um, creative writing as a discipline, a way of teaching creative writing. So instead of having someone who is at the front of the room um, lecturing, which is one model, um, but a very default model of instruction, um, we have a, a table in which um, folks sit around. And then um, let's say we're workshopping a poem for that particular day. We hand out copies of that person's poem. And um, we've read it in advance. You know, so maybe it was handed uh, around the last week. And there's feedback written on the poem. Um, people have um, engaged with it for a bit. Now everyone arrives to class. And then we start sharing feedback. There's this thing called a cone of silence. You know, is uh, some of the ways in which people put it, cone of silence, over the author. Um, and uh, we can say more about why um, there is this cone of silence. But basically, people offer feedback on the work. Um, they say things like, OK, this particular combination of words, um, I'm not sure that it's doing as much as it could be. Would you consider substituting this other you know, combination of words? Um, what about breaking the line here instead of here? I think that this might be more powerful. Um, so those are the kinds of um, feedback that people might get within a creative writing workshop. It's different from the ways in which uh, we might teach within a um, an English literary studies lecture, in which I'm standing up there, I'm talking about, like, let's say, Paradise Lost, you know, um, things having to things having to do with why Milton in jams the lines or doesn't, you know. Um, so.
so what we had within the creative writing workshop was much more of a workshop environment where people sat around, um, sat around the table and we all critiqued each other's work. Okay, I want to go to um, uh, something that Clayton Crockett, um, a scholar who um, examined uh, Jacques Rancière, and, uh, the, and Crockett says, the master explicates and the students learn, most of all, their incapacity, their own ignorance compared to the master. So picture a situation in which um, if I'm in a literary studies classroom, what I'm doing is explicating uh, Paradise Lost. You know, um, hey students, you've got a copy of Paradise Lost um, in your backpack or in front of you, um, but you need someone who can help you um, understand it. You know, you can't necessarily understand it yourselves, even though um, you've got a copy of it. Um, what you need is me at the head of the room um, giving you a hand, helping explain it to you. Okay, so one of the things that is implied within this kind of dynamic is that um, because of my training, because of all the time that I've spent studying Paradise Lost, studying Milton, studying English literature, um, getting the kind of credentialing that allows me to be in front of the room in the first place, um, that means that um, there's someone between you and the book. Okay, so within this dynamic, what, um, what is implied, no matter what the content of what comes out of my mouth about Paradise Lost, is that there is this power dynamic between the students and I. Now, I don't want to lionize creative writing. There are all sorts of things that we can say about creative writing as a practice, and I tried my best to say it when I taught creative writing. Um, but at the very least, people were offering feedback in a creative writing workshop on each other's work. So there's at least a basic understanding that there's a different dynamic there. You know, we are helping each other um, understand the poet's work, you know, or the writer's work. I want to tell you about a poem that one of the incarcerated writers um, had um, written, which was all about taffy. I don't have a copy of it. We weren't allowed to bring um, writing. We, were no, weren't, uh, we were very scrutinized in terms of bringing stuff in and out of the prison. Um, it was a poem in the form of a recipe as to how to make taffy. What it required you to do was to um, take extra packets from the dining hall in the prison um, and also get your hands on garbage bags <coughs> that you would cut open and then lay out on the floor. Um, and then you would get a whole bunch of other ingredients and you would you know, lay it out on the floor, let it dry, and then you would, um, it would go through a number of steps. Basically, um, it showed you how to make taffy. Now, one of the things that I found very striking about this poem is one, um, this poem could not, um, it's, it's tongue in cheek and it's a bit funny, but it could not have um, but responded to the material conditions of the prison itself. You know, it's like that's part of the entire joke of the poem. Um, the other thing is the fact that it's a recipe. You know, this, is, this suggests something like cooking, where let's say somebody improvises, figures out how to do something a particular way, and then formalizes it in the form of a recipe that can then be handed off to others. So that kind of play with something that is rules-based, like um, a recipe, but then also the improvisation and also the kind of situational intelligence that comes with being able to respond to the material conditions around you, and also a sense of audience. You know, you don't hand this poem off to one of the guards, to one of the correctional officers. Um, you share it with other people who, for whom this matters, and potentially with people like me. So um, that's one of the ways in which we might be able to understand that, in fact, um, the writers, through something like this poem, are able to undercut the kind of dynamic that um, Clayton Crockett had mentioned before in terms of, you know, there's an instructor at the front, and one of the things that is taught is um, how um, unable the students are to be able to um, do things for themselves and learn things for themselves. And I want to go to Jacques Rancière, who says, um, 
any individual can always, at any moment, be emancipated and emancipate someone else. You know? And that's one of the things that um, I want to draw our attention to in terms of something like this Taffy poem, but also in terms of Tuwilaze's poem in the first place. I'm going to um, move, actually, to Okay. I'm going to move to the final lines of, um, or paraphrase um, one of the first lines that Tuile said, um, what makes you so dangerous, what makes me so dangerous, and also the last line, which is um, what makes you so dangerous too. So that kind of equality um, across people. So that potential, that radical potential to be dangerous. Um, so I want us to um, end on that note. OK, thanks so much. Uh -huh. So is this program ongoing? It is? It's still going, the creative writing part of it. That was from this year's annual report for the prison. It just sounds so confining. Did you get a, a kind of, did you feel that difference between yourself and the prisoners? That, I mean, you could, you were free to come and go, but wasn't there some sort of really kind of what I feel, sense is a bullying atmosphere from the guards, the whole administration? Um, definitely. I mean, there are ways in which I, um, okay. <coughs> Let me tell you about a moment when the difference between the, the writers and the teachers and also the administrators um, was very palpable. Mm -hmm. on, okay, so on the very last day that my co-teacher was, um, was teaching, um, one of the writers um, gave her a poem, oh, okay, slipped her a sheet of paper and said like, um, you can read it whenever you want. And, um, and we left, you know, we, we said our tearful goodbyes, or um, you know, they said their tearful goodbyes to her, and she said her tearful goodbyes to them. Um, and then, they, and then um, when we were at home, um, I get a call from, when I was at home, I got a call from Marianne, my co-teacher, um, saying, you know what? Um, I just read the poem, and the poem is um, basically um, about a sexual encounter between um, the writer and I, um, imagines it out. And uh, we were stunned. You know, it's like that, that totally changed the feel of the entire goodbyes and that kind of feeling. Um, we knew that um, if we didn't <laughs> report this, we could get into a lot of trouble. The program could get into a lot of trouble. But we also felt tremendous reservations about doing so because we understood that the prison administrators um, could do whatever they wanted with this now. Um, and we felt as if we had no choice. Um, we told the prison administrators, and that writer got, well, we found out afterwards, got solitary for, I can't remember the amount of time, but the person was put in solitary. Ouch. All yeah. because of a what? A, a, a fantasy? Um, of hers? <laughs> or his? Or whatever? Well, like, um, it's... So they were punished for, because that was out of bounds kind of thing? Was, yeah? Yes. Yes. So, so there, there was, um, you can see the positioning of the different parties involved. Yeah. Um, that's such weird language to use, but yeah. And yet that last quotation makes it sound, if, if you, can you go back to it? Mm -hmm. Something about emancipation, there's so little space or room under those conditions for any kind of emancipation, mm -hmm. except maybe fantasizing. <laughs> as this that is brilliant. Is. That is brilliant. Um, in terms of fantasizing, um, one of the quotations that I wanted to um, mention was uh, one of the writers said, our imagination will not be limited to these four walls. And this was with reference to the fact that um, people were doing all sorts of different kinds of writing. People were writing sci-fi, people were writing songs, they were bringing in their guitars. Um, and, okay, so this is one of the things that I, one of the beefs I suppose, that I have with um, a documentary that was made by Eve Ensler called What I Want My Words to oh, Do to You. She's so in that, <laughs> in that documentary, um, the only kinds of things that the writers 
um, write about, or it seems apparent that they write about, is prison life. You know, it's like everything is with reference to the prison. And um, in my group, um, and also I've read in anthologies, people saying the equivalent things, that it's like, you know, we don't have to just write about prison life. We can write about anything. We can write about sci-fi, we can write about whatever, um, but our imagination will not be limited to these four walls. Um, and that, I think, was um, very important for me to acknowledge, that not everyone is going to be writing about prison life all the time. Um, that's one of the, there's, there's a lot more to say about how to um, be responsible to that, not just in creative writing, but in uh, using other tools as well. Um, I was going to show some videos, actually, um, about possible ways that we could do that, but. Is there a library in the prison? Sorry, I just thought. There is. Um, there is, okay. Yes, okay. absolutely. Mary? Yeah. So, I think that Jeff Rose here is sort of an interesting personality here in this analysis, because a lot of people, particularly me, <laughs> have really struggled with Morancier and the ignorant schoolmaster, because it's it's not clear, uh, not that clarity should be the goal for political analysis, but it's perhaps unhelpfully unclear what are Jacques Morancier's politics. And so the ignorant schoolmaster, I, I really see it as an anti-pedagogy. So in the ignorant schoolmaster, he really takes pedagogy to task and he mocks the French curriculum development people on any idea that you could instrumentalize the, the praxis, if you like, of pedagogy in such a way as to achieve equality. Mm -hmm. He really takes the very idea of a kind of pedagogy as an architecture of human interaction under a very critical spotlight. And at the same time, I've seen Jacques Rancière really be taken to task in terms of the, the way in which his apparent politics is kind of impervious to any analysis of race, of gender, of sexuality, of economic injustice. And so I really want to hear more from you how it is that, that Rancière's politics give you a way to think your way towards something like uh, radicality in relation to pedagogy? Mm -hmm. So I would say that one of the um, beefs that I do have actually with, um, let's say the creative writing approach that I had mentioned to you as a way of accessing radical equality or having some sort of pedagogy of radical equality um, is that for one thing, it doesn't respond necessarily to its own material conditions, you know? So um, for example, the history of creative writing um, as it is taught um, has to do with a very historical moment in which there were certain things that, um, there were certain aesthetics that were popular, you know, such as confessional poetry. Um, you couldn't, for example, um, okay, think there are other aesthetics that are difficult to critique within a creative writing workshop, such as spoken word poetries, you know, which um, has a much different um, racial history, you know, uh, racial, community-based, um, it is, that's one of the reasons why spoken word poetry is, um, if you bring a spoken word poem to a creative writing workshop, folks might say something like, well, we're just focusing on the page. We're not thinking about performance. Um, we don't know how to deal with performance. And um, in fact, shouldn't it work on the page by itself anyway? So there we can see how um, friends of mine, you know, um, as well as um, students who are very invested in different histories of creative writing, might feel excluded from an entire discipline or the way that that discipline is institutionalized. Um, within a creative writing workshop that um, I might on one hand um, say, well, this is one way in which we are able to move um, beyond the kind of lecture-based format, um, that has its own problems as well. Um, so that's one way in which I might um, address it in the context of this. Are there any boundaries 
that you and the incarcerated writers put up to keep this program and your work from being, for lack of a better phrase, inspiration fortified by the university or by the prison? Because that would be my biggest concern when doing something like this yeah. is it being removed from its context to be turned into feel good nonsense. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wrote, I wrote um, an article for a uh, journal called Le Panoptique, um, as in the Panopticon, um, that, that did attempt to take um, that entire feel-good dimension of the public humanities um, and say, okay, why, um, what are some of the concrete ways in which, let's say I get backpats, you know, um, by people and say like, oh, that's such great work that you're doing. Um, and one of the ways in which we might be able to approach it is to look uh, again at the material conditions of what is, um, what counts as a legitimate knowledge product within the public humanities. And I'm just going to be very specific and say, um, within the humanities exposed program, what were the things that we were expected to produce as knowledge makers, you know, like as scholars, as writers. Um, and these were things like, let's say, anthologies um, that could then be put inside a glass case inside the Center for Humanities. Funders could come along and they could say like, oh, this is great work that you're doing. Here's a check, you know? Um, and to be sure, um, these checks funded the taxis that brought the undergraduate students to the prison in the first place. You know, without these checks, you know, like we would have had to figure out something else, um, if at all, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's like a, there's a dimension to it in which it, it fits into a economy of um, knowledge products and uh, the kinds of things that we are able to leverage using, let's say, the cultural capital of this year anthology that we spent the year creating um, and that we needed to finish by the end of the year so then we could you know, get more grant funding. So um, there is that kind of um, dimension to it that, that is worth critiquing. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that it's kind of like, um, if I were to think about something like the um, philanthropy and, let's say, Gold's Corps putting in $20 million into the SFU Center for Contemporary Art. You know, it's kind of like when we create things like these anthologies, when we write poems, when we produce articles, it all becomes fuel, you know, um, for potentially naming a building <coughs> for $20 million um, after Gold's Corps or the Earth Sciences Wing um, for Barrick Gold and et cetera. If we could go back to the quotation, the, the report, there's mm -hmm. something there that's worth thinking of. Um, this one? Yeah, I'm quite struck by that. <laughs> this asset, uh, thinking. So the creative writing program, UW Madison graduate students provide instructions to inmates mm -hmm. wishing to enhance their creative thinking and writing abilities. Mm -hmm. Classes are eight weeks in length and cover topics within the following areas poetry, memoir, fiction writing, and African American studies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, you mentioned economics, and yep. I want to think through disciplines. Uh, so what, is, what ends up being focused among poetry, memoir, fiction writing, and African American studies? Why? <laughs> There's something there that mm -hmm. maybe I'm hoping you can maybe help us think through relating to Mary's question about race and prison. Mm -hmm. uh, why that this becomes the focus of studying and how is the prison itself articulated its own project without necessarily realizing what it is doing. So we know the history of incarceration mm -hmm. and, and I just find this really quiet that the prison will put this out and that admits to its own project uh, <laughs> without mm -hmm. necessarily wanting to do anything about the history of incarceration, who is being incarcerated. Yeah. So yeah. maybe if you can help us think through why African <laughs> I mean, it's obvious why, but maybe uh -huh. you can help us speak a little bit about how the institution is admitting its own project. Admitting uh, its own project. Yeah. Uh huh. So, um, okay. So one of the one of the things that this could um, speak to, or we might read it in relation to um, Wisconsin's rather dubious distinction um, of being the prison system, the state prison system that. Uh, incarcerates um, disproportionately black males more than other states. You know, like it holds that dubious distinction countrywide. Mm -hmm. um, so this could be um, the prison's attempt 
to say like, okay, um, we are going to provide some sort of educational programming um, that addresses this by um, putting it on the putting it on the table. Um, this also becomes part of how um, the university, you know, is able to legitimize its project too, uh -huh. you know, um, by saying that we are um, working together with the prison in order to address this. Um, yeah. And even I was mm -hmm. hoping we could go further than that. Mm -hmm. More than the university saying we are addressing it, how does the university become the site for the pipeline? I'm also the pipeline. to think through the university's relationship with prisons and uh -huh. actually that kind of intimate relationship, the industrial, I think you've talked about, written about it, the, uh, uh, the academic industrial system and mm -hmm. the prison industrial system. And I'm thinking here in this, there's something there possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, because poetry, there could be any kind, there's poetry that's not this thing. It could be African American poetry, it could be any kind of poetry, but it says this poetry stands on its own, memoir mm -hmm. stands on its own, yes. fiction writing stands on its own. Yes. But in terms of an, a, a, an area of studies, yes. uh, and there's a history of African American studies, it's not an, it's an, in, it's an institute, it's, a, it's an area of field that yeah. was attempted to disrupt, interrupt uh, uh, a, a particular kind of disciplinary institution. So mm -hmm. there's there's the link that maybe there's an opportunity here for us to kind of think through about these both industrial systems that are, Angela Davis talks really well about this, but I'm still yeah. really quite striking to mm -hmm. see this as the, the report. Mm -hmm. the courage, you know, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just comment on that? Mm -hmm. And I think that there was a hand there as well. Is there another question first? Okay. Yes, no? Um, was there another hand? Anyway, okay. I can't help but perceive that as a kind of philanthro philanthropic reformism rather mm -hmm. than the, 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 the prisoners themselves being able to write anything radical and claim that as their own property. Mm -hmm. This whole thing, this link between the university and the prison, mm -hmm. I think Angela Davis would say, is reformist. They're just tooting their mm -hmm. own horn. They're not... And they're... they're getting some money out of it to fund the university. It's kind of the way the system is. <laughs> we don't like it. <laughs> then what do we make of the taffy poem and the kind of acts of resistance within that system? Like, How do we think through the place of, of the incarcerated writer in this kind of structural analysis? Because um, they, they butt heads, right? Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they are wishing, the inmate wishing to enhance their creative thinking. And we, we mm -hmm. don't, we, I think maybe within the university we seem to take for granted what creative thinking allows, this creation, mm -hmm. the imagination. Like this, it's something, this creative thinking isn't a given act. It's like a liberatory practice. Mm -hmm. And so there's something wishing to enhance their creative writing and writing abilities. And so the, the tension I'm hearing when you talk about this, that how do we, it's beyond this, I think it's beyond that I'm actually, I'm thinking about what slips past what the, what the university, or in this case, what the report is trying to do. There's something, there's, a, there's something I cannot capture, even if it's attempting to control it. That it's, it cannot, it cannot contain, to use your, the quotation, the imagination cannot be contained within those four walls. And in many ways, it's actually articulated that within the report. There's this, there's this essence, theme, that cannot be contained. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. We're going to contain you, or we're going to teach you about the field that actually will talk about your liberation. <laughs> <That's>, there's, <laughs> there's something within this thing that Elegantly put. Mm -hmm. to grapple with this tension that the, uh, anyway. Yep, totally. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah, I'm not sure if people have heard about this, but in October, mm -hmm. a group of inmates at a penitentiary in, in upstate New York challenged the Harvard Debating Society to mm -hmm. debate, mm -hmm. and the prisoners won. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of news media about that, but I think what was a bit more buried in the stories was that the question that they were debating was uh, public schools in the United States should have the ability to deny enrollment to undocumented students. And the prisoners were given the, the, uh, the side of the debate that in fact undocumented students should not be allowed to enter schools. Mm -hmm. So the, the debate created a kind of um, an infinity loop, you could say, for the prisoners. I don't know how it, it's decided which side uh, a team goes on, but that was, that 
that was the result of that. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, inmates were working with a program called the BARD Humanities Project, mm -hmm. which goes all the way across the states. There's lots and lots of individual projects, and they're united by BARD College in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, so they can get credits through the college. Mm -hmm. And these programs, they're called Fermenting Versus. They just received a humanities award from President Obama a few weeks ago. What they do chiefly is they are a kind of bridge for people, either people living on very low incomes or people who are incarcerated, so that they can get first year university credits. Mm -hmm. Because it's not as difficult for the, them to get into second year as it is for them to get into first year. So it's a scheme that is, uh, I mean, it's an American version of an, an improvement scheme, really. Mm -hmm. And it's authorized all the way from the top of the state, from the president, and all the way through. And I think um, I know something about that. I work with the Humanities 101 program here at UBC, mm -hmm. um, that it does free education for people who live in the downtown east side. And um, uh, we do ours much differently than they do them in the States. They are filling a perceived gap. I think in the states, but also it's the same highly normative program. Mm -hmm. So it is it isn't offering really an alternative. It is mainstreaming what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Further responses. So thank you, Ray. Uh, how is a poem dangerous? How is a poem dangerous? Okay. So um, and I know that um, you've uh, addressed. Um, you know, what a poem is for um, in other contexts as well. Um, okay, so how is a poem dangerous? I think, I think I might concretize that by pointing to the Taffy poem, for example, um, and say, um, okay, so what is the thing that, what are the things that it puts into relation? You know, so um, what exactly um, does this poem put together and suggest about new ways of configuring things? Um, if we're going to put, for example, a recipe, you know, format, um, but then have it in this context in which we are making taffy within this particular system, um, that's one of the ways in which it can put things into relation. Um, and people can do things with that, you know. Um, it's a um, kind of social action alongside other kinds of social actions. So that's one potential way in which um, a poem can be dangerous. Does the dumb poems also deny us of certainties? <laughs> and that's dangerous in a world where we are so certain, or we want to be so certain about things. And the poem denies of that certainty, but that certainty, that is bloody dangerous. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I just, that's, yeah, that's really, really dangerous to know how certainty is. There's, I, I would love to be able to follow up on that in terms of a poem in relation to other, like, let's say, genres. Yeah, so I think that would be a really interesting question. You maintain any kind of relation with the people inside. You're not like, allowed to. You're not allowed to. You're not allowed to. Seeing or nope. No. One of the things that um, we produce a lot of writing within that group. Um, one of the things that I wanted to be able to offer up to people was the possibility of having their work published because I know that publishing is a what? It's a watermark yeah. of um, what people might want to achieve. Um, if I do that, you know, if I, let's say, um, get someone's work published, and let's say they um, leave the prison, you know, um, I can't stay in touch with them to tell them that their work has been published. Because there's, a, there's something um, called fraternizing rules, you know, where you can't keep in touch with someone um, after they have left the prison. And that's actually led to some very awkward conversations um, because you know, I will bump into a writer, or I did bump into a writer on the bus. You know, I, I thought to myself, wait a second, is that so and so? Um, and then the next time that I bump into him, um, you know, it's like it, it was a very awkward conversation because we, un I think we understood, or at least I had the sense in the back of my head, we're not supposed to be talking to each other. Like this is against the rules. Still, you know, it's like we had a conversation. So, so yeah, we aren't supposed to stay in touch. Yeah. I think I, I, I wasn't sure I was the one to moderate, so I think we have to wrap up. Maybe we have time for one more question. It's, it strikes me that the, the, the whole, there's a tension within the whole prison industrial complex in which there's this kind of excess, um, whether it be the sort of excess that is 
you know, that spills out in the danger of poetry or um, the excess of taffy making, but there's that the prison industrial complex is always trying to make whatever it is, whether it's the creative process or at what time you're allowed to shower, um, contain. I used to do a little bit of outreach in a women's prison around uh, safer sex. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're not allowed to have sex in prison. And so it was this bizarre, abstract um, task where you would talk about the sex they're not having <laughs> mm -hmm. and how they could have safer not sex. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you wouldn't be allowed to demonstrate anything. So you could have a condom, a dental dam, a this, and but they couldn't touch it. Mm -hmm. You couldn't really do anything with it. Mm -hmm. And so it was this, it was this contained mm. And yet everyone participated and everyone learned and everyone was happy to participate and, and the learning happened despite all the attempts to make it not happen. Yeah. And yet for the desire, you know, there was funding, they let us in to mm -hmm. do this non-event. <laughs> and it, it seems like everything kind of smacks of that. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. you know, that there's, there, that it, it's impossible to, I think, bound people, and and I think it's a, you know, at the end of the day, it's about trying to take away their their humanity, trying to take away their humanness, whether it be through poetry or non-sex sex or um, brushing your teeth or, you know, um, this sort of whatever this attempt is uh, to put African American studies into the program. Mm -hmm. um, that it's a negotiation of their own impossible boundaries that they are constantly trying to maintain. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of insidious. Yeah, and it's interesting to um, become an agent of that. Yeah. You know, as uh, someone who is, you know, shuttling back and forth like every week to the prison, becoming an, an agent of that. Um, at the same time that, um, as you say, uh, JP, the like things like the taffy poem suggest ways in which that might potentially break open if we glimpse opportunities too. So, thank you so much. <laughs>